Spanning the globe, it's World Affairs Roundup. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents World Affairs Roundup, a monthly edition of International Focus, providing opinion and analysis of global events, with John Kotzka, a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service, Anne Hamilton, political scientist at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service, and Robert Craig, executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin and author of articles and books on American foreign policy. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now, here's your moderator, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus and another edition of our World Affairs Roundup. Our Roundup regulars have assembled once again to provide penetrating insight and analysis of recent world events, including Greece on the Edge, having metaphorically turned to searching for spare change under the couch cushions to meet this month's financial obligations, Athens may be running out of cards to play in its negotiations with European creditors. Are we at last on the brink of the nation's long-predicted exit from the Eurozone? TPP ceremony. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited Washington this week in part to encourage reluctant members of Congress to support the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a controversial mega-trade deal supported by President Obama. What are the issues and how did Abe address them? When life gives you Yemens, the ongoing insurgency in Yemen continues to generate ripple effects, including a shuffle in Saudi palace politics. Who are the players and how might the game end? And gas pains. Profits for Russian energy giant Gazprom dropped 86% last year following Moscow's actions in Ukraine and related ruble troubles. Now it faces an anti-monopoly suit by the European Commission Accounting for fully 5% of the Russian budget, Gazprom's woes are not good news for Mr. Putin in the short run, but does Europe really have an energy alternative going forward? Well, welcome back, everybody. It's always good to see the A-team re reassembled. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with Greece, if we could. Uh, recently, the uh, negotiations were described as Greece coming to the table with a noose around its neck. John, where are we exactly right now? We're, we're where we were about six months ago. Uh, I've, you know, there's two possible outcomes that, that most people think about. Uh, there is the kick the can down the road, which we've been playing for, for quite a while now. And then there is the Grexit, meaning Greece leaves and we deal with the consequences. But I heard another one, that a third option to this. And, one, and it deals with some of the uh, possible unintended consequences, and that is what happens to the rest of the pigs, as they're, they're called, the, the Portugals, the Ireland and uh, uh, Italy and, uh, Por and uh, Spain that, that fill out the rest of this, uh, uh, the pigs in this, this metaphor. And that's, they would, the EU, the ECB, the European uh, uh, bank would provide additional support to these economies while Greece leaves so as not to uh, undermine uh, whatever is going on in those countries in terms of uh, investment that w might dry up because of uh, the, the uh, withdrawal of Greece. So, uh, and just how dire is this? I mean, what, uh, what are the obligations that are coming up that they're going to have trouble meeting? Well, they have um, obligations that are due both to the European Central Bank as well as to the IMF. Um, and there, as, as you said in your introduction, there's very little money to pay them off. Um, I think that John talking about kicking the can down the road is probably the most likely scenario because I think that um, the, there's, a, there's a strong incentive for the Greeks to, to stay, for, for people to protect the union in the sense that even if they decide to leave, and the Greeks could decide to leave as Argentina did um, when they, you know, said, you know, we're just going to default. And it was a nationalist move that they made um, that was at least for, for a week very popular. Um, but um, it, I think that the Europeans, even if the, if the Greeks leave and they default on their debt, they're going to have a basket case on their hands and they're, they're going to have to deal with Greece one way or the other. So um, I don't know. I think the most likely scenario is kicking the can down the road. 
But what about the the box that uh, the current ruling party has put itself in? I mean, the, their platform was really very much anti-austerity, and, and we're not going to let them push us around anymore. But it seems like there's increasingly less willingness on the part of their creditors to uh, to have anything but full payment. So how does that likely to shake out domestically? Well, it's the classic situation if you ride the power on populism, but then you end up with this kind of crisis where there's a reality to the debts and you're actually worried about representing people, which is, you know, their nationalist feeling versus uh, let's lose even more GDP. I mean, they've already lost at least a quarter of their GDP. It becomes, a, I think you're correct, a box uh, for, the, for these leaders. What is not transparent to us, hopefully it's transparent to the EU, is exactly whether there's any progress at all, what benchmarks and metrics might be, whether there's a way to actually wind this down through kicking it down the road or whether it's just getting worse. It's hard to say because obviously the reduction in GDP actually greatly reduces and degrades the ability of Greece to pay back its debts. And so further austerity and slowing the GDP further doesn't necessarily help, it hurts. There is, there is a way out of this for the Greeks, and they, are, they have already uh, thrown it out there a couple of times, and that is a, a, to call for a referendum on the subject, which gets the political party in power uh, off the hook to a degree, or call for new elections. Uh, it, it is a form of kicking it down the road, but it, it, in a way it transfers the responsibility to the electorate as opposed to the, leader, the, the leadership of the government right now. You know, in some of the other moments of crisis in this long story, we heard a lot more conversation about the, the danger of contagion, how, uh, mm -hmm. how this would spread. There seems to be much less concern about that these days. And that being the case, what, uh, what is preventing the European Central Bank and the EU generally from just saying, fine, you don't want to pay, you're out? What, what's, what's the downside for the rest of Europe? I think it's the principle of the EU, right? They literally, the, you know, so the whole question, the whole European movement and having one unified economy as at risk in all of this. So that seems to be, there's a lot of pride involved, I would say. There's also precedent. Once you start it, the Moody's, other parts of the pigs, right? Right? Moody's has just come out with an opinion on this, which is very negative in terms of uh, Greece leaving and says there's a lot of consequences to this in terms of investment, as well as uh, uh, the shakiness of some of the other, of, the, of what I refer to as the pigs. But there's a great example of where the tools available, monetary policy, uh, tightening up, austerity, actually make the situation worse. And, and EU at some point should have an industrial plan for how Greece has got a viable economy that could pay its debts back and, uh, and start employing people and, and, and start creating jobs. And that's absent. It's all about, you know, most of what they're doing is actually making it much less likely that Greece can pay it back, but they don't want them to default either. Well, one of the... I'm, I think it's more than just about the uh, leaving the euro. It, I think it, what, what Robert was saying about the, the whole significance of the union itself, and when you think about the potential for a referendum in Britain, for example, um, that that could play into the effect there. So I think that, that the whole union is at stake here to a certain extent. And also, this is, this is one piece of, of, a, of, as you're suggesting, of a much larger European problem uh, it, with the immigration that we're looking at right now is part of this problem. Uh, the rise of the nationalist parties is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between the south and the northern, northern parts of Europe and between austerity and relaxing that austerity is part of the problem. So uh, are we at the moment where it's going to take a, a fork in the road or is the kicking the can down the road the more likely outcome in this current round? Can we bring this up again in September? <laughs> <laughs> the can is almost the, always the most attractive, it seems. Yes. <laughs> almost, <Very> almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move across the pond now, if we uh, will. Uh, Shinzo Abe was in town in Washington this week, uh, in part to promote the, the TTP, or I'm sorry, TPP. Right. Uh, trade agreement, and talk a little bit about just the outlines of it, I mean, sort of the scale of, of this agreement. Well, it's, a, it's a, a massive trade agreement that would include, is it 10 countries or 12 countries? 12, 12 countries, um, major trading partners, um, and um, it, it, it's 
some of the thoughts on it are that it's a very important agreement. They've been working on it for many, many years. Um, and some of the advantages of it would be to, to create mechanisms that could help bypass the World Trade Organization, which is rather unwieldy because it would have dispute resolution um, mechanisms in it as well as just arrange, uh, you know, agreements on thorny issues. With, with Japan, the particular issues include agriculture and automobiles, as usual. Um, but the, one of the major problems here is that, of course, uh, it, I was thinking of the Iran nuclear deal when I was thinking about this, because, because the, nobody really knows what the details of the, the exact details are, but uh, the president really wants fast-track authority so that Congress can't veto certain parts of it. So um, it's, it's a very thorny issue between the United States and Japan in particular. Well, and, and it's massive, as you say. Uh, the scale of commerce involved is something right. estimated around 40 percent of the world's commerce would be right. encompassed right. Yeah. in this. So, Robert, is this just sort of the, the pushback against it? Is there anything particular to this deal, or is it just the standard lack of sovereignty, lack of transparency kinds of things? Or, or is there something about this one that's different? I think uh, that it's partly how badly the previous trade deals worked out as far as the position of American labor, right? I mean, it's been very good for American corporations, uh, but it's pitted worker against worker, and it's not really helped with development either because it's, it's led to the exploitation of workers in less developed countries. I think it goes even further in terms of sovereignty because the efficiency you referred to is actually an efficiency that allows multinational corporations to sue and have an arbitration process against any regulation they don't like. Like. So a regulation designed to, 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 say, reduce global warming could be brought up literally as something, and, and a lot of consumer regulations that are, that are out there in the U.S. or Japan. And so it really is a step towards a world government for 40 percent of the world's economy. And so, and the fact that it's done in secret means that agribusiness, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, Hollywood, uh, they, uh, they all know what's in it. Uh, but consumers and workers, and quite frankly, most of the politicians offering fast track authority don't. I understand they get to go into a room and not take any notes and take a look at the whole document, is apparently the process. That's a little bit overblown. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I mean, I, I would suspect that individual components of, of the, of the, uh, that participated, like Hollywood, like the auto industry, would have contributed pieces of information for that, but they wouldn't have, know the, in, the totality of it. No, and they're it, only interested in their, in their well, line. <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. fair. I mean, they're giving their, their input into it in terms of where their interests are. Well, if they're finding uh, a way to lower wages of their own workers, then it's a problem, right? Yeah. The wage issues and the job issues is not related to free trade. It's related to the way in which the world's economy is changing. No, no, we're structuring the economy, and this is what, how we're doing it. I'd say the system is being created uh, through the, these agreements. There's a political dimension to this as well. <laughs> Well, uh, not, not this, and not this political dimension. <laughs> there, there is, in terms of China, this is organizing 12 countries that are on the periphery of China in, that has the potential to serve as, as an economic mechanism with political dimensions to it. So is this the, uh, the analog to NATO enlargement in flaming feelings in Russia? I mean, how, how do the Chinese feel about this agreement? It's hard to say, but it's certainly in, um, Prime Minister Abe was presenting this as the geopolitical significance of it. Um, and so they're, they're, they're very much seeing it as building this, this regional network against the Chinese. Um, and so then it ties into all of the military aspects as well. And, the, and, and it certainly raises the, the issue of China's China's recent moves in the South China Seas and and the efforts of this then trade block to counter some of that. So I, th I think you can see it partly as a package. No, and and, and uh, John and Anne are absolutely right. This geopolitical part, there are some people who think that we're essentially trading away economic value in return for this geopolitical position. And you have to question, we're going to militarily pivot towards Asia when we can't really aff afford our current defense budget, and it's coming at the, co at, the, at the cost of a lot of domestic priorities. So that plays in as well. There's both the economic issue I brought up, but the geopolitical element is actually trading off in some ways against the economic element. Well, uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that one, fast track or no. Uh, first, we'll take a short break, then we'll be back. 
The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to our World Affairs Roundup with John Kotzka, and Hamilton, and Robert Craig. Well, uh, let's turn to Yemen, and maybe you could give us sort of a broad brush look at the situation on the ground. Who's who, and who's fighting who, and <laughs> who do we like, who don't we wow. like? How much time do you have? <laughs> well, the, uh, as part of the, going back, the, the Arab Spring, there was some... Um, uh, activity against the, the regime in Yemen, and the president there ended up leaving the country. Uh, he's now involved again. And they've had negotiations for quite some time that appeared to be proceeding quite well. And But it's all fallen apart. There's a, there's a group called the Houthis, a tribal group who had been very strong in the north, if I remember correctly. And now they have taken, they had taken a lot of territory, including the capital. And um, there's basically a civil war going on there that um, between various groups, it not only involves the Houthis from the north, but a movement in the south as well um, for more autonomy. And um, the Saudis have started, have become involved. They've always been involved, but they've become more involved by bombing uh, major airstrikes against um, the Houthis because, they, uh, because of the Houthis' affiliations with Iran. So it's a lot of people are saying this is really about tribal allegiances and not so much about the Sunni Shia conflict until recently when the Saudi intervention turned it into more of a Sunni Shia part of the Sunni Shia overall regional conflict. Well, and beyond the the sectarian aspect of it, I mean, just the the sort of struggle for hegemony in the region, isn't it? Is this a sort of a proxy war between the the Saudis and, and Iran? So it's both. There's actually a civil war on the ground, then there are two regional powers, Saudi Arabia and Iran, using as a stalking horse. And Saudi Arabia has a, a new leader, has shaken up the royal palace, so to speak, and now had, they're taking a more kind of militant approach and are claiming that they are driving the Houthi away. The Houthi is Shiite, of course, and therefore they are aligned with Iran. And Iran is seeing it the same way. So it really has become a, a struggle between those two regional powers. I would see it a little bit differently. I mean, we, first of all, look at the, the, the percentage differences. The, 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 the Sunnis are 60, 60 to 65 percent of the population, and the Shia 30 to 35 percent. Um, the Saudi Arabia has had a long in, interest in whatever happens in Yemen. Mm. Uh, this is not something new. I would say that Saudi Arabia has a much more compelling interest there than Iran does mm -hmm. and is more likely to be successful in seeing what it wants to see come out of this. The, what I think has happened in, this latest, in the latest phase, which was unfortunately interpreted by Western media as the end of hostilities and then all of a sudden the bombings continued is that the Saudis now are looking for uh, a negotiated settlement out of this. And what they uh, what they want to make sure is with the bombings is that the Houthis uh, and the, and the, uh, the Saleh, the former president Saleh's group, is not successful in, in uh, getting the upper hand again. And so if, if, that's, if, they're, if that's the way in which this goes, then I, I see a negotiated settlement somewhere down the road. And uh, we saw this week a, a shakeup in, uh, in the palace in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. The crown prince was moved aside in favor of the nephew of the king, and uh, some other people were changed in their position. And to what extent does... Uh, does Yemen play into that? Well, the person um, who was named the second, um, 
deputy crown prince is that who's they don't people don't even know how old he is he's between 29 and 35 i think um, is has been in charge of the operation in yemen and so he's this was seen as really i mean it's the first time they've gone down into that generation in terms of a succession plan so it was seen as a reward for his his um, his actions and and that they will continue I've heard one extent. suggestion that the, that the the previous uh, previous person in the position was was much more uh, against the air war, not not didn't see this as a way in which you were going to be able to do anything significant, and and the the, the person who's just come into the job was much more in favor of that. Mm -hmm. So we can assume then the current policy is likely to, to stay in place for a while, huh? Well, assuming that, that, that the goal is that negotiated settlement, uh, that's not a bad plan. Well, uh, let's move on to uh, your old stomping grounds, John, and uh, Gazprom and their financial difficulties. First of all, talk a little bit about just where they fit in the Russian economy. Well, th this is the amalgamation of of the the post-Soviet period uh, amongst the number of oligarchs uh, who grabbed uh, whatever they could as this was as the Soviet Union was coming apart. Uh, they grabbed entire industries. Uh, Gazprom, under Alexei Miller, uh, was one of the principal uh, beneficiaries of that process, especially as Europe became much more interested in, uh, in natural gas as a substitute for coal and uh, other forms of uh, fossil fuels. Um, this has been a bad year for Gazprom. Uh, you know, aside from the sanctions and the, the drop in the ruble, and the sanctions were leveled specifically at Gazprom and its leadership. Uh, in January, they announced a 20% uh, cut in uh, expenditures for 2015. That's a big step down. Uh, they, they stopped the South Stream uh, pipeline that was supposed to come into Southern Europe uh, through Ukraine. Uh, there's talk of moving to a Black Sea one, which would avoid the Ukraine, and, uh, and, and, but there's no, that's nothing specific yet. There has been a shift in, in Gazprom. Uh, because of the the warm feelings that they have with the relationship with Europe, they're 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 now moving to China. <laughs> <laughs> and, but there's a there's a downside to that. It's going to cost 15 billion dollars to build that pipeline uh, to China. Well, and 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 give us some sense of just scale here. This is this is not a mom and pop operation by any means. No, it's it constitutes something like. Um, I, I keep forgetting the figures, but it's certainly a huge portion of uh, the energy exports um, upon which Russia um, depends. It's is it eight percent of the Russian economy? Five, five, five percent, percent of the, of the, Russian of the national budget. budget. I think it's eight percent of GDP, though. Eight yeah. percent of GDP. Um, it's a it's a huge huge company, and it has a lot of leverage because uh, in your introduction you talked about the extent to which Europe has any other options. But still, Europe a lot of countries in Europe are highly dependent on on gas from Gazprom. Thirty percent of Europe's total gas supply yep. comes yep. from Gazprom. It's going down a little bit. So, uh, Robert, talk a little bit about the pushback on the part of the European Commission. There's this lawsuit that was just filed saying basically what? Well, they're accusing them of anti-competitive policies, uh, charging more to countries that are more dependent or in a weaker position and charging less to countries with more leverage, like Germany. And so they filed this, uh, this case. Apparently, it started before the Ukrainian incident, so this was already in process. So some people think it's a hard case because it's very hard to prove what the right price ought to be, right? And, and, and they've, they've kind of resisted doing that before. Some people see it as some sort of negotiating position, quite frankly. So hard to say, but it's such a, it, you know, uh, it's so important to, to Russia that it certainly is a major concern. And part of the concern seems not just to be about prices, quite frankly, it's the use of, of gas prol geopolitically. Uh, to punish enemies, reward friends, etc., and that's why a lot of Europeans would love not to be as dependent on Russia as they are. But there aren't that many alternatives. It'll take a long time for Iran, the second who has the second largest number of reserves ever, to have the capacity to actually supply the European market. But if you're looking at 
Eastern Europe and the Baltic states, they are completely dependent, like 90 to 100 percent. And even Czechoslovakia is over 60 percent. So it's a serious or, issue. Or its successor states. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they be really beat up Lithuania over What will be this. interesting to watch is Gazprom is dropping in terms of its importance. It's still important, as we've noted. Uh, is is how Putin goes about his balancing act amongst the, the his major mm -hmm. uh, uh, Gazprom's major uh, sponsor is uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the prime minister. Now he doesn't come with any particular stock of his own. He's a technician, mm -hmm. uh, but his the, the counterpart uh, Sechin over in uh, in Rosneft, the the oil company, is one of the Soloviki, the the, the former KGB types that uh, that made up so much of uh, of Putin's inner circle. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you for joining us yet again. And to our viewers, thank you. And we'll see you again next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.